Hello and welcome to today's episode of Dip Tech Talk. On this show, I like to interview people who have different perspectives of the same policies that impact the entire defense industrial base, and today is no different. Today I'm interviewing a small business owner named Allison. Allison runs a manufacturing company outside of Atlanta, Georgia. The struggles that she faces to implement the cybersecurity controls are the same struggles that every manufacturer in the defense industrial base faced. Allison has been really proactive in implementing the NIST 800171 controls, and now she's tackling the CMMC. Join me as I chat with Allison to talk about how she's tackling the CMMC. Hi, I'm Leslie Weinstein, and this is Dib Tech Talk, a show where we make sense of all things cybersecurity for the defense industrial base. In this series, I'll introduce you to cybersecurity concepts and industry experts. I'll also review innovative products and solutions to help you implement and manage your cybersecurity program. Let's dig right in. Um, on this show, we like to bring in a whole a bunch of different types of people to get lots of different perspectives. And so we brought you here today to talk about your unique, well, maybe not unique perspective, but definitely to talk about your insights into the manufacturing industry, uh, specifically within the defense manufacturing industry. So can you introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your background, and then we'll get started. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for having me. My name is Allison Krejci Giddens, and I am the president of WinTech, an aerospace manufacturer located just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And I, uh, my background is in psychology uh, with criminal justice focus, so uh, I ended up in manufacturing naturally. Um, <laughs> But I, um, I, I migrated to manufacturing because I was attracted to working for a small company. And um, it meant something to me to be able to be a, a big fish in a small pond and to make a difference um, with initiatives that I was taking and that I was eager to get involved with. So I've been uh, in, involved in a lot of manufacturing uh, stuff for the last 14 years. I've learned the ins and outs of uh, running a small business in the meantime. Um, but the operations aspect of the manufacturing side has just always been fascinating to me. Awesome. So when you say small business, how small are we talking about? Because, you know, the, the defense industrial base ranges from like, you know, single person to, you know, multinational. So how big, how small are we talking? We have just under 50 employees. Okay. So we are... Excellent, um, excellent perspective because I think um, that's an o often overlooked uh uh, group because they don't have somebody to advocate on their behalf. So it's hard to like to talk about that uh, that perspective without talking to each individual one to get their collective experience. So I appreciate you sharing your experience and your insights into how this is impacting uh, these size companies. So the first topic I really want to talk about uh, is flow down. So uh, we have this interim uh, DFARS rule with the CMMC and also the NIST requirement, the self-reporting requirement and it introduces some new DFARS clauses, uh, and we have the old DFARS 7012 clause, which was, quote, flown down from the primes to the subs, and the same with the CMMC, it's gonna be flown down uh, from the prime contractors to the subs. Can you talk about what you feel or how you feel the flow down responsibility should be communicated from the primes all the way down, and who has that responsibility, and what are how, how does that look in, in practice for you guys? So right from the get-go, when CMMC started to become um, a part of, of everyday language in the manufacturing world and security, um, I noticed that there were some things that were missing in the conversation. Okay. And that has to do with, obviously, manufacturers, if we don't already agree, then we're going to agree that CUI, it's very important for, for us and the supply, supply chain to address. But the flow down, how that happens after the actual manufacturer. So just because there's a manufacturer involved doesn't necessarily mean the buck stops there. So I have suppliers and I have to flow down information. So the Raytheons, the Boeings, the Lockheed Martins of the world that flow information down to it, their 300,000 small business manufacturers, ultimately we have to go and say to the same thing to, to our uh, metal suppliers, our chemical film processors, hey, look, this is a such and such order from such and such, and they're delivering to the government. Therefore, the following has to take place. You get so far down the line that I don't know that enough people high up on the food chain recognize that there are plenty of sole sources out there. And if you can't get one of those sole sources to play ball, you've essentially just kind of, you, you've had to stop your process. So the more... 
um, the more we talk about CMMC and the more we um, talk about the different levels that are going to be required. And if you don't play ball, you don't play ball. I, I almost hope that it's not it's not cutting off our nose to spite our face. Um, there is there in, in good conscience, you can't conscience, you can't make exceptions either. Um, it's like having uh, smoking sections in a restaurant. It, 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 if somebody's smoking in there, you're going to smell it no matter where you're sitting. If, if the whole purpose here is to fix a weak link and to make sure that those along the supply chain are as secure as humanly possible and beyond, then we have to figure out what to do about those instances where there are sole sources and there is a mom and pop shop and it's the only place that has a tank big enough to chemical film a piece of aluminum and they're not interested in upgrading to a firewall with uh, FIPS or and so you know and so on and so forth. So I think yeah. that's really part of the missing conversation. Do you think there's any uh, room, especially like from your perspective, uh, any way to maybe extend an instance of your network or offer some sort of creative solution so that they don't necessarily have to undergo their own CMMC assessment, but somehow envelop their IT infrastructure or offer them some sort of way to VPN into yours so that you can grant them coverage somehow? So there's, I think there are a couple of different levels. I think the the notion that a rising tide lifts all ships is important. Um, but I also recognize that there's there's a level of risk that you take too. So if there's a mom and pop shop that might be underneath us that we say, look, we're going to send you this print. We're going to send it through a secure email because it's, it's CUI and uh, you need to quote it for us. And let's say, God forbid, they have somebody come in that maybe is not through the e-verify system or somebody not qualified to be looking at at CUI, well, then who's who's ultimately to blame? Is it us because we told them, hold our hands, we'll walk you through this? Or is it them because they took the order? So I, I think that there's um, there's a lot here to, to bite off. And um, I, I'm just concerned about the further down the food chain you get. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, to that point, I wanted to talk about the self-assessment requirement that's that's been implemented in this new interim rule uh, you know, you're talking about the CMMC flow down if there's a supplier that doesn't want to play ball. So now the DOD has put the onus on you guys to not contract with companies who haven't done a self-assessment. So how are you handling this new requirement? Are you leaning in and getting started with that? Or how, what does that look like for you guys right now? Um, the more I read about it, the more I wish that there was a statement that uh, expressed the intent of the interim rule, because the way I'm interpreting it it is to bridge that gap between for, for a timeline for people to who are pulling out their hair saying, oh, my gosh, I'm a small business and I can't make this happen in the next six months. And we're going to lose contracts because of it. It's almost as if the folks who are making the rules said, OK, we recognize that and we're not going to do this to the detriment of business and, and government and national security and armed forces and all this. So I, I almost feel like that was the um, plan B. Uh, almost like, okay, we're going to ease you into this. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I cringe and hope it doesn't do it to the detriment of national security for people to be ch continuing to check off the box. Um, but I do recognize that there definitely needs to be more time in figuring out what to do about those that either cannot business-wise make this happen. Um, and does that mean that they go away from government contracts? And if that's the case, and you do have a sole source, <laughs> then how does that get reconciled back up the food chain? Because these tiny little ripples ultimately affect a lot of bigger assemblies and a lot of support for, for aircraft and other aerospace national defense equipment. Yeah, so how are you guys going to verify? Um, like, I understand the system's not really up and ready for people to submit scores yet. Um, so are you guys asking for scores from your suppliers right now? Are you giving them a heads up like, hey, we're you guys will have to report, we're gonna to have to report, but until then, can you tell us what you're thinking or how are you managing that risk for you guys? About eight, about 18 months ago, we started this path and we made tiny little changes and improvements here and there. And that has done us a very big service. I highly recommend if, if people have not already done that, you probably need to start taking bigger steps than we initially did. But um, we have started, uh, 
about, oh gosh, 12 months ago or so, we started using a, a different secure email system. And when we did that, we got a lot of pushback from our vendors because just like anything else, it was yet some other login and password now they have to keep up with. And we recognized that. And when we communicated this new requirement to them, we we immediately recognized that. We expressed that to them saying, look, we understand this is burden. This is another burden on you. And uh, we promise it's in everybody's best interest. And eventually they got on board. Um, so they've had, they have started to see a lot of our vendors have started to see these little changes, um, at least coming from WinTech, that look, these are the expectations that are going to be set. And there is, there has always been flow down on our POs. And we are just going to have to start um, as the CMMC takes shape. And as these five years go by, we are going to have to start seriously looking at when it comes to risk mitigation, who are we reasonably assured is are following the rules along with us? Yeah, and I think that goes to another topic, um, uh, which is making this routine, educating your workforce, getting buy-in, right? Like it's ultimately changing culture. What steps have you taken with your company to change the, the culture internally to kind of buy into this new cumbersome process? Because I'm sure it's not just the new email system. I'm sure you guys have done things over the last 12 months that have annoyed Lots of other people. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, definitely, for sure. So in a small business, the person that's going to install your printer um, is probably going to be the same person configuring your firewall. And that has to change with, with CMMC and with new standards and security. Chances are the person that's installing your printer, uh, if they're going to configure your firewall too, then they're likely a full-time IT person. And there aren't too many full-time IT people in very small businesses. Um, there are little things that we've done along the way to help people get used to life as we uh, see it coming down the pipe. And that um, we've, we've invested heavily in training. Um, that's a really big thing, um, I believe, with just security in general is our employees are our first and our last line of defense. And if somebody's gonna click a link through an email it doesn't matter how great your firewall is. It doesn't matter how great, uh, you know, your physical security and key fobs and visitor passes are. If somebody clicks a link or gives information to somebody over a phone, it's it's over. So it's all about mitigating that risk. And it's all about making sure that your employees are empowered with the knowledge of here's what to look for and not stopping there. You can't train once a year and check the box and say, okay, we're solid, we're an L3 or whatever. You have to stay on it and you have to use the data from training to drive what's next. If you've got 30% of the people failing a phishing test, okay, don't, don't retest them in six months, sit down and figure out what's going on. Why are they continuing to fail a phishing test? And then go from there. Yeah, so are you outsourcing this training and these phishing tests? What resources are available to small businesses that are affordable? Because I imagine there's a ton of resources for large companies. They can just buy it out of the box and some fancy people in suits come in and train them. But how have you made this affordable for, for a small business? Thankfully, since we personally, we have taken tiny little bites as we've gone. So the dollars, as big as they are, they've not all of a sudden overnight affected us. Um, we have outsourced a couple of things, but mostly we've customized things out there um, and then made them our own. Uh, there are a ton of resources on LinkedIn. I'm sure anybody knows all I have to do is hashtag CMMC and you get a bajillion very knowledgeable people. A bajillion, that's a, that's a real term. <laughs> it's a real number. Uh, <laughs> it's a real number. It's got a lot of zeros. Um, they've got, a, a, there are a lot of people out there with some fantastic resources um, and it really, it's almost too much. Uh, there is a I lot agree. of information. It's totally overwhelming. So I'm hoping that you can help cut through this clutter and like help people find the legitimate resources. Yes. Yeah. Oh yes. And I'm, I'm personally happy to connect people if, if they're willing to reach out um, via message, I can, I can connect them to uh, people who have provided me with some really good spreadsheets and direction. And it's all going to be about objective evidence. It's all going to be about what can you prove to an auditor that you are doing. And for those in the manufacturing industry, if you've gone through an AS audit or an ISO audit or a NADCAP audit or all these different audits, it's going to be the same, but not. So it is going to be a new culture change. It is going to be embracing 
the objective evidence and embracing doing what you say that you do and saying what you actually do. Um, but it's a whole nother level. And it's one thing to know the, the ins and outs of manufacturing and parts, but chances are, again, the people who are on the shop floor knowing the ins and outs of AS9100 are not the people that know the ins and the outs of your DCHP protocol. Da, 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 da. They're not the same person. And so to be able to get on the same page and to make sure that both aspects are taken as seriously as they should, that's the real challenge. So um, with all of these multiple requirements for ISO and whatever other certifications people may have, how have you guys managed these multiple requirements and sometimes overlapping and sometimes not overlapping? Do you guys have a single compliance person that deals with all of it or how have you guys managed all of these things? Um, I am very fortunate in that my husband is in the IT world. And so when he gets done for the day and when I get done for the day, we work on WinTech IT. No, um, <laughs> I, I pick his brain. Um, and a lot of it is validating things is I'll do research on the side and say, here are the priorities that, you know, that the CMMC world says I need to focus on. What does that mean for me? And he'll kind of give it to me in layman's terms. And then I've got to turn it around and figure out if it's doable or not. Um, there, there is a, um, I, I cannot imagine how daunting this is to small businesses that do not have resources um, like I do, whether it's at home or the ability to um, sift through the noise on LinkedIn. Um, I would recommend doing your research as a small business, doing your research on uh, managed service providers or cybersecurity companies and getting their references too. So don't just go with whoever's the loudest on LinkedIn, but ask for some of their references and, and do some Google searches on reviews. And a lot of times all it takes is one very knowledgeable security uh, individual who can help point you in the right direction to a lot of the different resources that will help you help you get things situated. Yeah, no, that's totally true. And, and if you're not a cybersecurity person, how can you how can you even tell if somebody's knowledgeable or if they're just selling you a line? Um, yes. So uh, in that vein, how have you guys handled writing the policies? Because the CMMC level three has a very explicit policy procedure and resource documentation requirements. So how have you guys managed that aspect? Because that is something that I imagine most manufacturers have never considered having to write an access control domain policy. So how did you tackle that? So I will say I, I personally stumbled across something about a, six months ago, uh, called the Harvard Online. Um, it's a cybersecurity risk mitigation certificate. And it just so happened that it came across my desk in March and it was, or in April, and it was right around the time COVID hit. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to be sitting in front of a computer anyways. So let's learn stuff. And so um, I went through this, I think it was an eight week class, and they basically took it from step one and helped you create a cyber risk mitigation plan. And before it was all said and done, I had one for WinTech. And being able to come up with something using the guidance of both academia and industry, to be able to come up with something and then butt it up against CMMC and say, yep, this is where this is and this is where this is. I, I recommend, the class was fantastic. Um, I learned a lot. Um, look for some kind of resource like that if you have the time and the resources to do that. Um, it wasn't a piece of cake. It was a lot of, of learning as you go and um, a lot of figuring out what applies and what doesn't, but it gives you a newfound appreciation to really what threats are. It's not just about somebody sending an email and somebody clicking on a link. It's a disgruntled employee. It's the HVAC guy that's walking through the back of the shop that really doesn't belong there. It's there are all these different things that you can you can get all conspiracy theory esque on, yeah. um, but ultimately it's it's how it works. They'll yeah, get in so, where they can. so you mentioned that you know somebody has enough time and resources to do this. How long did it take you from starting the class, understanding the concepts, to evaluating your policies or putting them in place to actualizing them? Right, you can't just write the policies and write the procedures, you have to implement them. So what is like the timeline that people are looking at if they're able to dedicate as much resource, uh, you know, re resource intensive effort like you were from start to finish, what are they looking at like at a minimum? Well, from start to finish for that class, it was, I probably spent five to 10 hours a week for eight weeks. Um, and that was already having a little bit of, I was considered a kind of a novice to this stuff. I knew the term terminology and the acronyms, even if I did 
swap some letters around here and there, but um, I, I kind of got the bare bones of it. And we had IT policies and procedures in place. Um, they just were not up to par for CMMC. And I found that we were doing a lot of stuff that CMMC required. So I think the other, um, the, it's a double-edged sword. Yes, it's daunting and yes, it's a lot, but chances are you're probably doing some of this stuff as, as long as these sentences are, some of them are said differently, the same or the same way, different times, um, trying to validate it is what you're doing, uh, what you're saying that you're doing. So I would say from get go, um, I would not, I would not say more than five to 10 hours a week for eight weeks. If, if you truly did give it a, a focus and a sit down and do it, not pencil whip it. Right. So, uh, and to your point about uh, you guys are probably already doing stuff that the CMMC requires, uh, which is why you can't just go purchase uh, some, you know, off the shelf policy stuff. You know, somebody charges you X amount of dollars and here's your policies because they're not what you're doing. Right. Um, so how much do you think you had to write? So the course, you know, took you five hours a week for eight, uh, eight weeks after that, um, doing the policy analysis, I guess, and updating it, what was the additional time that it took you? Like, not necessarily five hours, 10 hours a week, but like over time, because I imagine um, it doesn't just hope happen overnight. If you did have to adjust a procedure, how long did that take? It kind of depended because it was like peeling back an onion. It was, you'd sit down and you'd look at um, access control and you'd be looking through that policy and then you'd see something and you'd say, you know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, yeah, we have key fobs, but, and yeah, people sign in a visitor's log, but what happens to those sheets after they get filled up? And then you make yourself a note in the margin, talk to the receptionist, what, what happens to sheets? And you go down these rabbit holes and then she tells you, oh, they get scanned in and then the old ones are shredded. Okay, well, where do they get scanned in? And so it's almost like, it's just, well, it's not almost, it's just like AS9100 or ISO, where you want to give them specifics as to exactly what, what the game plan is but you don't want to corner yourself. You don't want to back yourself into a, into a corner either. So whatever you're doing, you need to put in writing and whatever you're putting in writing, you need to actually do it. So it sounds like you're the full-time cybersecurity and compliance person. So for companies that don't have people as with a, as much time, like you sound like you put in a whole lot of extra time because you either enjoy doing this or you're passionate about it, or, you know, it's a pet project. So for companies that, uh, you know, the people running it don't have the bandwidth. What type of staff would you, would a company need to replace you in your company? If you were to suddenly be bedridden with COVID, how many people would you have to hire with different tracks of experience to do everything that you've been doing for your company? Well, that's a really good question uh, because I just, uh, my coworker and I just bought the company from the founder um, and the owner. So now I'm also the president. Um, Congratulations, and, uh, <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, so gosh, honestly, I would say we would need a full-time IT person, although we have a third party right now that we use for some um, some kind of off, off on the side stuff. Um, uh, then you'd also need an AS9100 document control, uh, at least a point of contact. I think if somebody cannot afford uh, two or three humans to run those kind of things, it's about um, appointing certain people and holding people accountable and then making sure that those specific people that are in charge of either managing those policies or writing those procedures, empower them with the ability to do it and then make sure everybody discusses along the way. There's no such thing as over communication. And if these people are going to be held to those policies and required to make sure they get, they get updated every year or however, whatever frequency that you're uh, stipulating, all that has to happen. And then don't forget, you have to think about well, what happens if we actually have to put these into place? What happens if a disaster recovery plan has to be pulled? Being able to practice those um, and, and running incident plan, incident response plans and such, all of that is a requirement of CMMC to say that you are testing these things. But if when they say you're testing these things, exactly who? Is it going to be the person that wrote the plan and knows it intimately? Or is it going to be somebody that you ultimately handed off all these documents to and said, hey, every uh, nine months, make sure those are up to date and, and run yeah. a vulnerability And you test. should definitely put that in your policy, right? Um, like 
point who's responsible. And, and to that point, um, how do you make sure that your employees know what the policies are for those things and know how to access them? How, how are you, I guess, documenting and keeping your library of policies? So we have a matrix. We use a matrix. Um, and that matrix will have, it's got a few columns on it. And one of the columns has the specific section that it references for CMMC. Um, we did this because we do something similar for AS9100. So when we have an auditor come in for AS9100, we can show them our standards, our procedures, and the AS9100 standard, and they can easily go back and forth, and they're not having to dig for things. So we have a column that references the policy or procedure with the CMMC clause or the, or the paragraph or the section. Mm -hmm. And then we have another column with what department or if applicable individual it applies to. Um, and then another column for what part of the training it applies to for people. So for example, um, password policy, everybody needs to know that. If you've got a login on a computer, you need to know that, hey, by the way, you're gonna be required to change this every X days or every X amount of months. Um, something like disaster recovery plan, my quality control manager probably doesn't need to know that. Um, it's two in the weeds. He just needs to know where he plugs in. God forbid this building goes into sinkhole and we have to set up shop somewhere else with a miraculously appearing uh, shop equipment, quality equipment right? <laughs> uh, then, then how does he plug in from there? Um, so it is about making sure that your employees, yeah, training's great, but if you inundate them with all 50 something procedures or whatever, nothing's going to seem important to them if everything is important to you. That's right. Um, so do you plan as well prepared as you are and as forward leaning on all of this, um, do you intend or do you think you have the need or uh, should you bring in a third party before, like, let's say the CMMC assessors, the C3PAOs are hitting the street. Um, are you going to engage in a third party to come in and do a double check or do you feel confident that you guys have done your due diligence or, uh, you know, what level of third party support do you think you'll actually end up needing or wanting at least? We are likely going to do that. We um, have done a gap assessment or a gap analysis with um, a third party company that intends in getting certified to become a C3PAO. So they're on, on the track. Um, and the added bonus is that they have some history of how we got to this point. So they know some of our weaknesses and they know what we've been working on. And so they know too, when they come in, what they can look for. So it's just like any auditor. Um, if they have some context, it just makes you a better company. Right. So you do think that most companies, even as well prepared as you are, most companies will most likely need or should have some third party come and like, you know, do a double a discount, double check to make sure that you guys have everything. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think that like my nightmare, not not necessarily what keeps me up at night, but what keeps me up at night is to think that an auditor comes in and is looking at things and all the red marks all over the page and me standing there going, no, 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 I did that. I did that. We do that. And then him dropping off an invoice and walking out and me thinking, okay, not only am I 15 grand poorer, um, but now I have to do it all again after I clean this up. So to me, there's um, far less risk involved with, if I get somebody who is going to be trained on this to come in and say, you know, here, yes, here are your weak spots or yeah, you need to get buttoned up on this. And that way when an auditor comes in, I, I, I won't be losing sleep over that and I'll feel a lot more credible. Right, um, absolutely. So um, what advice or recommendations would you have for other manufacturers who are just now learning and waking up today and learning about the CMMC and they're kind of having a panic attack? What is your advice, like where do they start um, what's their timeline for the whole thing from soup to nuts, from maybe a gap assessment or a self-assessment? Like what is from A to Z? Can you walk somebody through, like hold their hand and tell them it's going to be okay and, and how they're going to get to the end? Well, first off, I would tell them that uh, they should be very happy about this interim rule because uh, <laughs> it's going to buy them some time if they can immediately get on board with some of the basics. Um, very first thing I would do is find somebody you trust that knows the IT stuff, that knows the network security. And IT is not network security and network security is not IT. So, you know, you, you wouldn't um, hire the same person. Again, you wouldn't hire the person to, who sets up your printer to necessarily configure your firewall. They might, and if they do, then keep that person on board as long as you can. Um, <laughs> give them a raise. <laughs> yes, yes, give them a bonus today. Um, but 
there um, first, that's the first is, is to find somebody you trust. Um, and then eat up as much as you can find resource wise, the CMMC accreditation body, that website's got all kinds of resources. Um, if you are not intimately familiar with NIST already become intimately familiar because that's, that's the backbone anyways. That's like, it's like watching the newest Star Wars movies and not seeing the originals. So at least get to know the originals before you start piling on the other stuff. Um, it'll help things to make a lot more sense too. And what should um, timeline wise, like how should they be thinking? Because people will call me and say, you know, my boss wants me to get this done in two months. Like, let's do it. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Depends on what you're doing, right? So let's say, um, you know, people don't, what is, what would you say is a, the typical timeline for somebody who doesn't know what they're doing? So they're probably not, they don't have policies. They probably are lacking a lot of controls. So what would you say realistically should be their, uh, you know, timeline for, for getting to a good place? So I will answer it and then I'll explain it. Um, anywhere between two months and two years. And it's going to depend on what level. So if you're getting certified to a basic level one, let's say that you are a, a landscaping company that does um, the lawn services for an Air Force base, chances are you're probably going to be level one because you've got prints of, you've got maps, you've got plots, you've got uh, plat maps. Um, so you're probably going to be a level one. You're probably not having to worry about some kind of crazy ramped up training course that you have to provide your employees every year. Right. Then you've got... Your, your level three, I think, is where they're saying about 80 percent, 60 to 80 percent of manufacturers or, or people that are CMMC certified or CMM certified will be held to probably a level three. Um, and then your level fours and fives have a lot to do with like, yeah. the, your missile defense and your all that. So that's that's going to be your extreme. Um, ultimately, that two months to two years, it's going to depend on what level and it's also going to depend on where are you now? So mm -hmm. if you've got 10 computers in the front office and everybody shares a login right now, you got a problem and you need to find that person you trust real fast. But if you start going through the CMMC, all the standard and, and you start realizing, well, gosh, really the only things we're not doing right now are little things like um, multi-factor authentication on the shop floor. I know talking to other manufacturers, that's a challenge because some of these older machines take flash drives well your flash drives that are whether or not you um you issue flash drives iron keys things like that that are permitted in specific workstations to transfer data um it, the the two-factor authentication on some of these older machines i mean that's problematic so if that's something that's on your radar and that's like the only thing on your radar okay well now you know where you can focus your efforts and now you know where you're going to have to figure things out but um, aside from that, I, I think that's really, that's the driver is what level and where are you right now? Okay. Yeah, no, I think that's great news because it does depend on what level. Um, so is there anything else that you want to talk about that we have not touched on that you think is super relevant and you really want the manufacturing base to know? Well, I think, uh, manufacturing base wise, uh, yeah, we, uh, I think manufacturing base, uh, we have to recognize the balancing act of network security, and that is a, a national we a national responsibility that that we should be held to, no doubt. But we also have to balance it with business efficiency. So it is just like anything else on our shop floor. Is if we bring on a new process or procedure, how is it helping us make money? Well, in this case, we're bringing on a new process or procedure, and it's only going to cost us money. It's not really going to get us money. You could argue that, well, if you become one of the folks on the short list that are certified, then the government gives you those, those dollars and doesn't give you those dollars, gives you those contracts um, for you to work for those dollars. But you could argue all, you could argue that all day long. I would encourage um, the folks making the rules all the way at the top to please consider that balancing act that we are going to have to go through. We are very good at following directions. We will do exactly what it is that you need us to do if we're told how to do it and what you need. But if along the way we're given conflicting instructions, especially back to that flow down, if we're told um, you have to flow this down and 
it, it's going to be your responsibility to make sure all of your subcontractors follow these rules. I can't logistically go visit every single subcontractor. So there, there will be some of that risk I have to accept. And so along the way, there, there needs to be some consideration for those much smaller guys. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that feedback, because um, I imagine if you provide feedback on the interim rule, it would sound very much like that. So I appreciate you sharing your thoughts. Thank you again for tuning in to today's episode of Dib Tech Talk. I'd like to end this episode in the same way that I end all episodes with a brief news update. I'm just kidding. No news update. I'm only here to encourage all of you watching today to go comment on the CMMC interim rule. In the same way that you shouldn't be able to complain about election results if you don't vote, you shouldn't be able to complain about the CMMC if you don't go comment. The comment period ends on 30 November 2020, and there are two ways to submit comments. I have them written down so I don't forget. First, you can go submit feedback uh, on the federal e-rulemaking portal at www.regulations.gov. You simply search for the DFARS case 2019-Delta-041 and select comment now. You can also send an email to osd.dfars at mail.mil. Comments will be posted without change to regulations.gov about three days after you submit them. Thank you again for tuning in. I encourage you all to go make comments.